Why is the Battle of Adwa so important to African history? It's important because it's one of the greatest victories against white supremacy and imperialism. In the 19th century, European countries colonized the entire African continent. They met at the Berlin Conference in Germany from November 1884 to February 1885 and just sliced up the entire continent like a piece of cake. Britain, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Belgium, England, you name it. And then Italy came to try to take its colonial possession, Ethiopia. And before the commander in chief left Rome, General Oreste Baratieri, he promised the king of Italy, at that time it was still a kingdom, King Umbato, that he was going to bring back Emperor Menelik II in a cage so he could be displayed in the zoo. Because he was confident all this notion of white supremacy made them really believe that Africans are basically savages, backwards. There's no way that any African army could withstand a European army. So to the shock, the Battle of Adwa, March 1, 1896, lasted no more than six hours. The Ethiopians killed about 3,000 Italian soldiers, captured almost another 3,000. General Baratiri himself fled from the battle scene. They killed two generals. They captured one general and marched them back to Addis Ababa, the capital which, by the way, was founded and named by Empress Taitu Betul, the wife of Emperor Menelik. And Taitu herself was on the front line with 6,000 men under her command. They made the 3,000 prisoners of war, the captives, the tables were turned. Now they made them work for many, many months under African supervision. So now you have Europeans tasting how it feels to work under slave-like conditions being ordered and commanded by Africans. Italy paid millions in reparations and then the captives were released. Now this is not taught widely in the history because it would explode the myth of white supremacy, that Africans are inferior, Europeans are superior, and no way could Africans defeat Europeans in armed battle, in war. And that is why the story is not widely told by the Italians and by fellow Europeans. In fact, some of the accounts were preposterous at the time of the battle, soon after the battle. Some of the magazines in Europe claimed the Ethiopians were actually Europeans. <laughs> so Italians had lost against other Europeans who just happened to be in Africa. That is why this history is important. The legacy is important. Africans all over the world whether they call themselves Africans or not, African descendants, must know this history. It is empowering. Please explain why Coltan is integral to the tech industry and why Africans are not benefiting from it. All right, in addition to Coltan, of course, Cobalt as well. Coltan goes into most of the electronic equipments everywhere in the world. So if it's a smartphone, if it's a computer, if it's parts of the instruments in planes, and sophisticated weapons, coltan is used. And there are only few countries in the world that have it. Congo, in particular, has most of the deposits in the world, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Yet, the average income of people in the Congo is probably less than 600 US dollars, as opposed to European countries where the average income ranges from forty to $60,000. And why is this? Even though electronic equipment is found everywhere in the world, in every country, no matter how remote the country is, how is it that Congo is not very wealthy? Because Congo does not manufacture. Congo sells it as raw material, raw minerals, then goes into the factories in the industrialized countries. And it's not by accident that most of the industrialized countries, all of them rather, are former colonial powers. Now you have new ones, of course, like uh, China, for example, is an industrial power now. And China was never really a colonial power, not in Africa anyway, even though it benefits from Africa's resources 
just as the European countries do. And all of them get the materials for cheap. And once they go back to their factories and their countries and they manufacture the products, the smartphones, the computers, the price compared to the raw material is exponentially, I don't even know by what magnitude, maybe 50, maybe 100 times higher than the value that they get for their raw coal time. And that applies to cobalt as well. And cobalt is increasingly going to be much more important, perhaps even than coltan, because cobalt goes into making the batteries for these uh, electric cars. And as you know, electric cars is the way of the future because of the environmental concern, the climactic issues. So in the next 10, 15, 20 years, it's all going to be electric cars. And in order to power those vehicles, they're going to need the cobalt. And the Democratic Republic of the Congo has 60% of that. So now, what am I suggesting? I'm suggesting that even if you can't get along politically, and I'm speaking directly to the African countries, get along so that you can benefit from the raw materials that you have in Africa. Because Congo alone will not be able to protect its coltan and its cobalt. It's not been able to protect the coltan. Look at it. The so-called tribal wars that people in the West read about in the Congo, Eastern Congo, those are not tribal wars. How can you have so-called tribal wars when at the same time people are digging resources from the ground <laughs> and exporting it to Europe from the same location where the so-called tribal wars are going on. These are wars that are financed by multinational companies. They give weapons, they give money to the neighboring countries like Rwanda and Uganda, for example. And then they send their soldiers there. They're basically working like mercenaries for the West. They kill people, they depopulate uh, the area, people run away, they plunder the resources, then they ship it to Europe, to North America, through, Kong, through Rwanda and through Uganda. Why? Because they don't want to pay the taxes to the government of the Congo. So they would rather heap African bodies to get the minerals for cheap. So the neighboring countries, first of all, of course, you need progressive leadership. If you have reactionary leaders in both Rwanda and Uganda, General Kagame, General Museveni in Uganda, it's not going to work. So it begins with the leadership. You need to have progressive leaders like we had uh, Kwame Nkrumah, of course, in the 1960s. We have Thomas Sankara in the 1980s. These are the type of leaders that really want Africa to benefit from its resources to build wealth and prosperity in Africa. So if they came together, they would be able to protect Congo and say Congo and the rest of Africa is going to get the fair value for the cobalt and you're going to have to pay us and you have no choice because without the cobalt, you won't be able to manufacture the batteries that go into the electric vehicles. But even beyond that, we want to start manufacturing the electric vehicles in African countries and then export it to Europe, to North America, so that they get the value for coming from selling those electric vehicles rather than selling the raw materials for peanuts. And that's always been the dilemma for African countries. Why did Europe colonize Africa. It wasn't because they have some particular hatred for African people. In fact, much of the racism is made up, manufactured. They, most of them don't even believe it, but they know it's very effective as propaganda in order to exploit, in order to, to, um, uh, to kill, to massacre, you have to demonize the victims first. So for example, when Europeans enslaved African people, you can go around saying we are going to enslave fellow human beings. So you have to demonize them and depict them as less than human. The same thing under colonialism. The same thing we have today under what is now called neo-colonialism. Demonize them so your peers in Europe can't say, wait, what are you doing to fellow human beings? So you have to destroy them first. Get people to believe that they're not fellow human beings. Then you can take advantage of their resources. And that's been the problem. They went to Africa, colonized Africans, they got cheap or enslaved labor. They took the minerals. They made Africans work on the land that used to belong to them. 
kicked them off the land, gave the land to Europeans, and then let the Africans work as cheap labor. Now, at some point, colonialism was no longer uh, tolerable, right, politically. Just like at some point, slavery was no longer tolerable politically. So colonialism uh, gave way to so-called independence. But independence was largely independence on paper. I would say there's not a single African country that is actually effectively independent, making their own decisions about their politics, about their economics, about their sovereignty. So they're independent on paper uh, only. In fact, one of the best lectures about this is called Crisis in the Periphery, Africa and the Caribbean, by the late Walter Rodney, one of my favorite historians, Guyanese. Brilliantly, he breaks down and he says, the system, referring to Europeans, always find answers. They're always one step ahead. So when they realize colonialism was no longer tolerable, they allowed the African elite, who may have African skin, but thought <laughs> like the European elite. So those are the ones that they allowed to take the mantle of state. So what you have now in most African countries are what I call European governors in African skin. They're not looking out for Africa's interests, and that's the problem. Why do you say current academic literature and media still contributes to the negative view African and people of African descent have about themselves? Right, of course, it's very effective. Um, and one way that I like explaining it is to refer people to a uh, short speech that's available on YouTube called you Can't Hate the Roots of a Tree Without Hating the Tree by Malcolm X. It's no more than five minutes, but it really captures it better than anyone that I've heard, better than I'm able to communicate it as well. And it makes sense. He said when Africa was controlled by the European colonial powers, they projected the image of Africa negatively. Jungle, savages, cannibals, backward, and it had a number of impact. It turned off Africans in the diaspora, including African Americans, from being attracted to the African continent. And as he put it, you know, it instilled self-hatred as well, without even realizing. He said, you can't hate your origins without hating yourself. You can't hate the roots of a tree without hating the tree, which is Africa. And he gave examples. He said, you know, we have people that hate the shape of their nose, hate the shape and size of their lips, hate the type of texture of their hair. So, you know, they hate every part of themselves and they internalize that. And this is impossible. You cannot hate your origin without unconsciously hating yourself. And the same applies to Africans in diaspora, also applies to Africans on the continent, because many of them also feed and read the literature that is produced in the West. Even if the literature is produced in African countries, most of the literature emulates the literature of the West. You have Africans that have always challenged that, like Chinua Achebe, the famous Nigerian author. Many people know him by his book, Things Fall Apart. Uh, Wole Shoyinka, the Nobel uh, Prize winner, although I believe Chinua uh, deserved the Nobel as well. But by the way, these are all Western uh, symbols and prizes anyway. But if you're going to give it to uh, Shoyinka, <laughs> Achebe deserves it too. And another one who also deserves um, the Nobel is uh, Ngugi Wationgo, he's a Kenyan. And what I like about him that he writes plays, he writes uh, fiction, novels as well, but he writes essays. In fact, my favorite type of his writing are the essays in which he criticizes Africans for abandoning their culture, abandoning their heritage, abandoning their history. In other words, he's saying the same thing that Malcolm was saying in a different language. That, you know, when you start aping the West, you start emulating the West, that becomes your standard and your measure of development, of achievement. When, ironically, as you know, living in 
the polluted industrial societies where life is so mechanical, you have a movement of Europeans wanting to go to Africa or the Caribbean, you know? So they know what is actually essential and of quality, but at the same time, they demonize so that Africans in Africa don't even know the value of what they have. They don't know how good they have it. So that has been the most effective legacy of colonialism. The Europeans don't need to have European soldiers in Africa anymore. They have Africans that have been conditioned over generations to hate themselves and police themselves. So when you have Africans wanting to emulate Europe and be like Europe, Europe feels no threat at all. And that is the dilemma. And that is why it's important for us to challenge the narrative. I hated that narrative, even from, as a young person, when I was 12 years old. I'm born in Uganda, but my family lived in Tanzania. And in Tanzania is really when I started gaining my consciousness. When I was 12, I started reading a lot of publications, books. And I noticed in Western media in particular, including United States media, that was disseminated there. The representation of Africans and African descendants was always as inferior. And I started writing letters to the editor. Throughout my life, I was doing that. But then at some point as an adult, you know, friends told me, why are you shouting from outside the walls? Why don't you become actively involved? So I went back uh, to graduate school. I studied journalism at Columbia, and I wrote my master's thesis on the historical demonization of Africa. And eventually, over the years, I continued the research. I, two years ago, in 2021, I published uh, the book Manufacturing Hate, How Africa Was Demonized in Western Media. And I'll tell you, it's been a challenge throughout. It's been a challenge since when I first did the research as a master's paper. We're talking three decades ago at, um, at Columbia. The paper won one of the awards at the school that they give us prizes at the end of the semester to about you know, five or six um, our papers. So it was one of those. And then a publication called Columbia Journalism Review invited me to submit it for publication. And it's considered to be a prestigious uh, publication. So I said, this is good. This might open the path to turning it into a book because this kind of racist depiction needs to be countered and it needs to be known widely. So I submitted, I wait, I see an issue of the magazine coming out, my article is not there. Second issue coming out, my article is not there. And now I'm about to graduate. And obviously I would like it to be published while I'm still about to graduate with my peers. So finally, I contact the publication and I call the publication, I speak to the managing editor, Michael Hoyt. And I say, I've noticed two issues of Columbia Journalism Review without my article, when is it coming out? said, well, it's not going to be published, actually. I said, first of all, when were you going to tell me this? No response. I said, well, what happened? He said, well, there was a vote, and two of people on the editorial board supported publishing, two opposed, and the executive editor, the top person, voted against publishing it. And I said, what was the problem? He said, well, there was a concern by some of them that these things happened a long time ago. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so you're going to write history of demonization without going back a long time ago, number one. Number two, you asked me to submit it <laughs> to a publication. I didn't come to you. I said, okay, anyway, it's fine. I want my paper back. And then he said something very curious. He said, why do you want it back? I couldn't understand that question. I said, what do you mean? I gave it to you. Now you're telling me you're not publishing. So I want it back. And he said something amazing that I remember up today. He said, well, it's not the same as what you gave us. <laughs> I said, okay, that's precisely why I want it back. So, you know, the Columbia Journalism Review is actually the same building from the journalism school is on the top floor. And he didn't realize I was calling him from the building. 
So I go upstairs to his office, and he's standing behind a pile, a stack of papers. And he sees me, and it looked like he had just, you know, put something underneath the stack. Some, you know. I said, I'm here for my paper. I was not in a mood for any niceties. And he goes around everywhere around his office looking for my paper and comes back to that same pile where I had found him. <laughs> and he pulls the same thing I had seen him putting under the file, pulls it out and gives it to me. And I'm like, what is going on with these people? So I start reading it as I'm heading to the elevator. And I'm paraphrasing now because obviously I don't have it in front of me. But in the beginning of the paper, they wrote something on my behalf after they had edited it, meaning they had considered publishing it, even edited it completely. And at the end of the day, after they censored it, decided not to publish. Now, what did they write? They write that, and I'm paraphrasing, that this paper, um, first of all, thanked uh, the New York Times for allowing me access to their archives, which is what I've done. I, um, after I did my master's study thesis, I wrote, I read many articles that the New York Times had published about Africa, going back to uh, 1850s and coming back all the way to the 1990s. And then I wanted to add some voice to it. So I had contacted the Times and asked if I could interview some of the porters that went to Africa in the 50s and 60s. And they said, and this is, we're talking a year before Google, right? Where you could just look up somebody very quickly. They said, that's going to be ter uh, uh, difficult. Why don't you do something easier? Go to our archives, because in our archives, we have files and files of letters that they sent from Africa and that the editors here in New York sent to them in Africa. So that could, you know, um, uh, give you a measure of their state of mind and how they felt about Africa, which is exactly what I, I wanted to obtain. So the paper, now that they've edited uh, on my behalf, saying, you know, they thank the New York Times, and they said, this article, referring to my article, is not, is not, it's not criticism of the New York Times. This article, uh, which involves interviews with many former New York Times reporters, is to show how any media outlet can go astray. So it was obviously clear to me that they were afraid of how the New York Times would react. And that's why they never published it. I did them a favor, I sent it to the publisher of the New York Times. At his, uh, the time, his name was uh, Arthur Ark Salzberger. And the managing editor at the time wrote back to me. We're talking 1990s now. His name is uh, Joseph Lelyveld and said, yes, you've discovered some very crude and ugly uh, uh, material about our past coverage of Africa. And he said um, he was a part of that, and he always tried, of course, to, imp to, 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 to improve it, and which is true. His articles were very different from all the others. He always uh, wanted to uh, and give the wholesome uh, image of Africa. And then I offered, I said, okay, let me write an an, uh, an opinion piece, an op-ed, saying this is what my research found, this is where the Times is now, this is where they still need to go. But <laughs> they didn't respond to that offer. Now, and I, 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 I give you this uh, uh, context so you can then understand the challenge that I faced after that. One magazine after the other declined uh, to publish it. In fact, I knew it was not because of the, you know, the quality of the reporting or whatever. I knew it was the substance, which um, they were afraid because many writers, many editors want to either end up working for the Times or at least publish something in the New York Times. So they don't want to be seen as somebody who uh, somehow, uh, even though it's their job, they claim, they always talk about objectivity in journalism, right? It only goes to a certain extent. There's some sacred cows that are untouchable. And I'll give you the best rejection I got. The best rejection came from uh, a magazine called The New Yorker, which is a major magazine, right? Uh, internationally known. And the rejection had the standard letter in the typed, said, you know, this is not, you know, a good fit for us or what have you. 
But on the letter was a handwritten note by the uh, editor who sent me the rejection, saying this is a good, a good paper, send it to Mother Jones magazine. So he's, he's suggesting that I try this other magazine, that I might try it. And first I'm thinking, wait a minute, why is the rejection saying one thing and then he's writing something else? And then I figured it out. The handwritten note, if we go back to their files, I guarantee you the handwritten note is not in the version that he kept in the files of the rejection. So I send it to Mother Jones, and Mother Jones rejects it too. <laughs> so I said, you know what? I'm going to stop this exercise in futility. So I just kept expanding the research through the years. Ultimately, I published it as a book. Now that's part one. Part two, getting the book reviewed <laughs> has been a major challenge, even by the so-called liberal progressive magazines. It's nonsense. I have... Uh, probably two or three reviews, uh, one from Kirkus Reviews, and it was a very good review, and one from a Congolese professor who teaches at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, uh, and, and Zongola and Talaja, George, he wrote a very good review for the African Review of Political Economy. Those have been the reviews. Uh, now, the final point on this particular aspect. Two years ago, the New York Times published a long article about the Kansas City Star which had apologized for how it depicted African-American citizens of Kansas historically. They went back into their dirty past, they owned it, and they published a long apology and said, we will do better from now on going forward. So I wrote to the New York Times uh, publisher. I said, since you did an article about Kansas City Star apologizing for their dirty past, why don't you owe up to your own dirty past that I made you aware about decades ago when I did the article, and now in the book. And I send them a copy of the book. No response. So that's where things are today. But luckily, in the modern era, with all these other media platforms, we are still able to disseminate information. But this also lets you know there are gatekeepers in the establishment, and they're always like lambasting, uh, you know, Fox News and the right wing establishment. But the so-called progressive liberal establishment are just as dangerous when they try to suppress our true stories as well. Do you believe social media has helped debunk many of the misconceptions people had or have about Africa? Absolutely, without a doubt. Without social media, the gatekeepers would still be able to dictate the terms. So now this whole nonsense this charade that uh, the wars in Eastern Congo are so-called tribal wars. In other words, Africans just wake up one day, so you know, I'm feeling tribal today, so let me find another African to kill. <laughs> you know, this nonsense has been partly debunked by articles on social media, where people in the Congo can now actually take photographs or videos of the so-called rebels. And you see that these so-called rebels have well-starched, ironed uniforms. They are satellite phones. They have the most modern weapons. These aren't so-called guerrillas or rebels. These are financed by national governments. And I gave the example in the beginning, the governments of Rwanda government of Uganda at behest of Western multinational capital. So people are able to disseminate those images with the captions. And then if you see that image and you still go to like a, a Time magazine or Newsweek or New York Times or Washington Post, they can't afford now to maintain that narrative of so-called tribal wars because they know um, most people now get their information from social media anyway. So it's been very powerful and effective. If social media did not exist, we would still be beholden to that false narrative. And that false narrative has the same purpose that this whole racist depiction of Africans as inferior. Uh, it serves the same role as that depiction of Africans as inferior did during enslavement, 
as I said earlier, you know, you can't be enslaving fellow human beings. So you have to convince the world that they may resemble human beings, but they are uh, morally, spiritually, physically, intellectually, actually inferior. That a lower stage of evolution. So, yeah, it's not the best thing that we're enslaving them to work for us, but at the same time, it's not the worst thing in the world, right? The same narrative during colonialism. Why are you ruling somebody else's country? You know, destroying their structures, their culture, their history, their leadership, plundering their resources, right? So you have to show them as, as inferior. And the same thing that we do in the modern era by depicting wars that are actually financed by the West as quote unquote tribal wars. And that's why social media has been very powerfully effective in debunking that. So you have less, you can do a Google research and you will find that you don't find reference to tribalism, tribal wars as prevalent today as you did as recently as 10 years ago. And by the way, I've been complaining about that depiction, uh, even though they never published my, um, my thesis paper, even though um, it took a long time for me to publish my book, through the years I've been engaged with writers at the New York Times, editors of the New York Times, whenever Africa was depicted negatively or in a stereotypical fashion, I would engage them. And occasionally, the managing editor would actually write to me and acknowledge. So this engagement, this uh, interacting is very important. And I feel that partly that may have also pay, uh, played a role in the, um, in the diminishing and then almost the disappearing of use of the term tribal, uh, tribesman, uh, tribeswoman. You know, you see it much uh, infrequently now compared to, uh, to in the past. But thankfully, social media has also played a very important role in doing that. Please explain why China and Russia were so important in the success of African liberation movements. Sure. Uh, it was China, and at that time uh, was still the Soviet Union, right? Until the collapse of the Berlin Wall in the 1990s. They came from a different history. Uh, China itself was a victim, as you know, of Western aggression, Western imperialism. The British uh, launch and the other Western countries, the Opium War against China because they wanted to keep the Chinese addicted. And when the Chinese started rebelling uh, because they didn't want the opium anymore, <laughs> you know, they crushed them. How dare you reject, you know, their opium? So China was a playing field uh, for the West, just like Africa has been historically and to a large extent still is. So China could relate to that African experience. And then China had the Chinese Revolution, of course, when they kicked out uh, the, uh, the Western uh, 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 puppet, essentially. And uh, he ended up running uh, what is now Taiwan, you know, after he was defeated by Chao, Chairman Mao and the Communist Party, uh, General uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, who was supported uh, by the West. So he went to Taiwan. So the history of China, China wanted friends because obviously they wanted to try to uh, snuff the Chinese revolution from the very beginning. So China obviously wanted friends in, country, uh, in particularly from countries that had experienced the history of imperialism. And Africa became a natural ally. And at that time, Africa was still colonized. African countries, beginning with Ghana, winning its independence in 1957. In March, in fact, we're celebrating it now, uh, March 1957. Most African countries did not win until in the 1960s. And then some did not win till the 1970s. And in the 1980s, 1980, in the case of uh, what was Rhodesia, became Zimbabwe. And South Africa, as you know, not until 1994, when Mandela was elected the first uh, uh, African president of South Africa and for the liberation armies that had to fight for Africa's independence. The weapons and the training came from China, the People's Republic of China, and from what was then the Soviet Union. So they would take Africans to their countries 
train them in warfare, how to become officers, and they will also give them scholarships, and they will also give them uh, weapons. And uh, another, another big supporter of African liberation that does not get enough credit is, of course, Cuba. It was because of Cuba's sacrifice that Angola was able to maintain its independence. In fact, Cuba under Castro intervened on a massive scale without getting permission from the Soviet Union. Even though the Soviet Union was subsidizing Cuba's economy, Cuba's military, all the weapons came from the Soviet Union. So you would think that they might want to check in first from with their main uh, benefit, beneficiary, uh, benefactor rather, and say, well, this is what we plan to do. But no, they did not want to risk the possibility of the Soviet Union saying no, because the Soviet Union by that time uh, uh, was trying to, to mend relations with the West and the United States. So they thought another intervention in Africa would jeopardize that. And that's precisely <laughs> what actually happened. But had Cuba not done that, Angola, uh, which had just won its independence under uh, the party called the uh, MPLA, which was led by Agostino Neto, who was, uh, of course, very pro uh, pro Soviet Union and pro China as well, uh, would have lost. There were two other contenders. One was UNITA, which was led by Jonas Savimbi, who was supported by the CIA and the West. And the other was Holden Robato, and his party was the FNLA, which was also supported by the CIA and the West. So those, one of those two would have ended up being the leader of Angola, and Angola would have been another reactionary country in Africa. But Cuba did not take that chance. So Cuba sent thousands of soldiers, first helped them to win that independence. So the government formed after Portuguese colonial rule collapsed in 1975 was by the MPLA you know, seen as more like socialist Marxist leaning. But then in 19, by 1987, the other parties, UNITA in particular, had crept back on the scene in a big way. The United States was supporting Savimbi, gave him very sophisticated weapons that even the Pentagon did not want him to have, like uh, shoulder-held stinger missiles that could shoot down uh, the planes of the Angolan government or the uh, or the Cuban military that was helping. So it became very powerful. And South Africa also sent its army, and South Africa was still ruled by the white racist apartheid regime. So now Angola once again had its back against the wall. And we, turn, we learned two lessons here. Cuba, when it comes to fighting in Africa, they knew much more than the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union, after that early experience in 1975, when Cuba went on a massive scale without their permission, now they're there all over the place. So Cuba can't do things like, you know, without the Soviet Union knowing about it. So the Soviet Union told the Angolan government, we will advise you on how to fight the South Africans and, you know, the Western puppet, UNITA, under Savimbi. And they suffered major defeats on the battlefield. In one battle, losing up to, I, I've read, 2,000 soldiers, the Angolans. And Castro said, you're going to lose this war. And once again, <laughs> without permission from the Soviet Union, sent about 30,000 Cuban soldiers and the best weapons he had. And there's a very interesting documentary about it. It's called A Cuba African Odyssey. And the filmmaker, is, her name is El Tahari, T-A-H-R-I. She's an Egyptian French filmmaker. And it describes how Castro himself was in command of the battle by satellite phone. So he wasn't even in Angola, he's back in Havana, but directing the battle, the famous battle of Quito Quanavan, where they defeated the South African army. And it was spectacular in many ways, because first of all, this was similar to Adwa where you have Europeans, the South African army, essentially Europeans, right? Believing, being brought up from childhood 
that they are superior to non-whites and there's no way could they lose in Angola. So when they were defeated and they had to withdraw, they realized something very critical. Then you know what? Since this Castro guy cannot even be controlled by the Soviet Union, they might actually follow us into South Africa <laughs> and defeat us militarily in South Africa and end apartheid on their own terms. And that might not have been the worst things, but they started acting, you know, as uh, Walter Rodney said, the system tries to stay one step ahead. So what did they do? They had been occupying Namibia, they call it Southwest Africa for decades. They suddenly withdrew and Namibia became independent. They went back to South Africa. Two years later, they released Nelson Mandela. They started negotiating for the post-apartheid state in South Africa. In 1994, of course, they had elections. Mandela became the first president. But once again, as Rodney said, the system is always one step ahead. South Africa, apartheid ended officially in 1994. Today, in 2023, the 8% European, less than 10%, 8% European population of South Africa controls 72% of the arable land. Just think about that. That was the essence of the fight against apartheid. And we're talking decades later, there's not been any significant land reform. But I could say that that is a battle for the, for the, for the current generation. Many people are critical of Nelson Mandela, that he, he negotiated and he gave too much to the white power structure. But I disagree with that analysis. My analysis would be that Mandela fought to the extent where he could take it. At least he brought formal apartheid to an end, just like Kwame Nkrumah brought formal colonialism, colonization to an end in Ghana and then Africa, other African countries. The struggle for the next form of decolonization, that belongs to this generation. And hopefully, it won't wait, wait till the next generation. That's my own analysis about it. And of course, you see it uh, happening now in South Africa. You see the economic freedom fighters, the party of Julius Malema. Each election cycle, they're getting more and more people elected uh, to the parliament of South Africa. And they've been very clear. They say, we are going to take the land without compensation. Why should you compensate somebody whose ancestors killed Africans and then stole their land? Why should we pay them money? And now the current government of the African National Congress is also adopting some of this language because they can see the election results too in each successive election cycle. They know if they don't address the land issue, eventually they will be swept out of office as well. When people hear the words colonialism and imperialism, they automatically think about Britain, Spain, and France. Please provide examples of American colonialism in the 20th and 21st centuries. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so what happened is uh, particularly the most monumental historic event, I would say, was World War II. World War II, and of course, it's not really a world war. It's a European war that ended up involving the entire world. <laughs> because Africans, you know, you know, had no beef with the issues that they were arguing over, you know, in Europe. You know, many Africans didn't know who Adolf Hitler was, uh, you know, who Mussolini was, right? Uh, but they became involved because they recruited hundreds of thousands of Africans that didn't even know where they were being taken to fight on behalf of those colonial powers, right? So Britain took hundreds of thousands of, uh, uh, of people to fight in the British army, in, 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 in Europe, in the Far East, and France uh, did the same thing, right? So at the end of that war, Europe was exhausted. 
the economies had collapsed, been destroyed. So Europe, in fact, during the war itself, throughout the colonial period, Africa had been sustaining Europe, but even much so during the war itself, when Europe, in order to feed itself, had to get food for African countries. That's how Europe was feeding itself and financing its wars. But at the end of World War II, exhausted. They could no longer afford to maintain their African colonies because their economies had been completely destroyed. Europe and Europeans would be in the same condition that most African countries are in today had it not been for the United States with what is called the Marshall Plan gave European countries billions of dollars in grants to repair their economy. Not alone, but grants that they didn't even have to pay back. So now, what is going to be done with these African countries that are now winning their independence? And in fact, some people who read the political scene of the day, Africans coming into leadership, realizing that Europe has now been weakened, thought that they might actually be able to enjoy true independence. But it started off from the very beginning, very early, where you could tell that they were not going to enjoy true independence. Congo, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, was the first major testing ground. Congo elected Patrice Lumumba, a Pan-African nationalist supported by Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana as his first leader, independently elected, democratically elected in June 1960. By September, he had been overthrown because the Belgians didn't want to leave. And what was he demanding? He was demanding that they change these contracts that took all the profits. At that time, coltan was not yet the big thing. It was copper, and copper is still a big thing today, by the way said, let's renegotiate these contracts so that we can also get a fair share and use the money to also build up our country. We're supposed to be independent, and yet we're still controlling our major commodity, which is copper. And of course, they didn't want to, to, that to end. So they undermined this government, and the United States sided with fellow imperialists, the Belgians and the British. The CIA was involved. Ultimately, Lumumba was killed in the most brutal way in January 1961. They wanted to wipe out his whole memory. You know, it's quite, and they call Africans the barbarians, but this is what they did. After he was killed by a firing squad, they chopped up his body into pieces, and then they burned the body, and then they crushed the bones into powder, and then they dissolved it in sulfuric acid, and they kept a, uh, a teeth. The Belgian police commander who was supervising this gruesome killing, a tooth and another body part. And this tooth was just returned last year in a major ceremony reported as the return of the remains of Patrice Lumumba. It was that one tooth. So this was the first instance of the United States displaying its neo-colonial imperialism on the African continent. Nkrumah was really brilliant. Nkrumah wrote a book called Neo-Colonialism, The Last Stage of Imperialism. I highly, highly recommend that book. If people don't have the time to read that book, just go online and Google it, and you'll be able to read the introduction. If you read the introduction of that book and you don't order it, then you're not serious about Africa because he breaks it down. And he says, listen, they wanted our resources before we became independent. So why should they not continue to want it after independence? So what are they going to do? They're going to s sponsor reactionary African leaders to undermine others who are talking about us uniting. But he said, the United States of Africa is the only way we'll be strong enough to enjoy real independence and to protect our minerals and to say this is the price we want for it and you must give it to us.
and we have the army to support that. So the United States realized that this guy, Nkuma, is an enemy of colonialism and neo-colonialism, right? And first of all, when the book was published in 1965, they withdrew $250 million that they were going to send to Ghana in financial aid. Actually, I think it was $25 million at the time. But if you magnify the value today, yeah, it would be more than $250 million, maybe even $300 million. So they withdrew that, took that off the table. And they wrote an official letter of protest, protesting against a book <laughs> written by an African uh, president. That book has the formula for African liberation. And they also worked to get rid of uh, Nkrumah. There's something called the archival history of the State Department. And I say this because it's something you can actually Google and it'll take you to the website of the State Department where they have these archival documents and you can read the memos that they were writing. It's right there online. The State Department writing memos to the World Bank saying, okay, you loaned some money to Ghana, even though the loan is approved, don't send them the money actually, don't disburse the money. Because if you do that, then the economy is going to weaken, and then Ghanaians are going to start protesting against Nkrumah, and then the military and the police is going to overthrow him. The memo was written in 1965. 1966, he was overthrown. So, and so other African leaders started seeing what was happening to African leaders who wanted to exert true independence. And then that's when the Africans who were willing to step forward stopped staying, stepping forward. You started having reactionary African leaders to the extent that when Donald Trump said Africa and Haiti, he said Haiti and Africa, collection of shithole countries, the most reactionary of these African leaders, who is General Yoweri Museveni of Uganda, said, I love Donald Trump. And people think this is too preposterous. Google it and you will read it for yourself. It was widely reported by all the major media. And he's a person that's been a very brutal dictator that's been in power for 37 years, fully backed by the West, by the World Bank, by the IMF. Go back to Congo. When they killed Patrice Lumumba, the person they put to succeed him was General Mobutu the most corrupt of the corrupt African leaders, stole $5 billion, drove his economy to the ground. Every time there was an uprising by Africans who wanted to get rid of this Western puppet, the West would send support to Mobutu. They would send weapons, they would send planes, and then Moroccan soldiers would go to help Mobutu to fight the war and stay in power. Mobutu was in power for 37 years, backed by the West. And now you have the other person, Museveni, who says, I love Donald Trump, not by accident that he's also been in power 37 years back there with the West. And that is the contemporary manifestation of U.S. imperialism in Africa. And then you saw another recent example, of course, in Libya. Libya was completely destroyed, saying they were going in to stop Muammar Gaddafi from, quote, killing his own people. That's what they said. So how are you going to stop him from, quote unquote, killing his own people? Bombing Libya 24-7 for almost eight months. And who knows how many Libyans were killed by NATO and the United States from that attack? How much infrastructure was destroyed? There's not been a single story in the Western corporate media. Nobody will take any accounting for what they did to Libya. And then had Gaddafi brutally killed you know, sodomized with a bayonet and then brutally killed, his body displayed in a refrigerator. And they saw this. In fact, one of the most preposterous <laughs> images that came out of this was Hillary Clinton, who was then Secretary of State under President Obama. She rushed to Libya and posed for a photograph with the people that they helped install in powers. You know, the New York Times were calling them as uh, I forget the term, whether it's like liberators or some nonsense like that, right? So she posed with them. You know, I think she had like the V sign, right? Because she's hoping this is going to help her when she runs for president down the line, that I helped bring Gaddafi down. I was tough on Gaddafi.
Of course, she never used that. Why? Because Libya has now been pushed back to the 18th century. It's a non-country. Libya had one of the highest per capita incomes in the world. Libya had free education, free housing, free health care. When people got married, they would get a marriage grant so they can start off their life. Think about that. Which country has that? Not even the United States. And now look. There's been a lot of propaganda about Gaddafi. Can you clarify the good and the bad of the man? Absolutely. Misrepresented, please. Yes, without a doubt. Particularly when he started out, he was he came through the military. You know, he got rid of uh, the, the king, King Idris. You know, he was very young. I think he was 27 when he came to power. And he was very popular, you know, revolutionary. I really wanted a pan-Arab uh, independence. I think his pan-Africanism uh, uh, came much later. So in the early years of his rule, in fact, he was very aggressive toward uh, neighboring African countries south of the Sahara in terms of his own imperial ambitions. But it was only years later that he realized that uh, you needed a United States of Africa, not only for the African continent, but for Libya itself to survive independently. So it was a learning process for him. Toward the latter stage of his life, he became a much better leader in terms of his Pan-Africanism. In the beginning, yes, he was also very imperial toward African countries, uh, south of the Sahara, Sahara, and very uh, destructive as well. But as he realized that Pan-Africanism was really the only true solution, he started sharing the benefits of the oil wealth with other African countries. He certainly uh, put a lot of it back in the Libyan economy. In fact, I remember watching an interview on CNN where one of the people who was cheering for Gaddafi to be overthrown, this is before it had been overthrown, was interviewed by CNN. So why do you hate Gaddafi? And she said, I hate him because he gives our money to Africa. <laughs> in other words, you know, she didn't see herself <laughs> as a part of Africa. But of course, Gaddafi was promoting a Pan-Africanism that would uh, include North Africa as well as the rest of Africa uh, south of the Sahara. And if you go back the actual details of why he was really overthrown and killed has now emerged. And the most interested party was France. France even though it's let go of its former African colonies in West Africa and in North Africa as well, it still has like a tight grip by virtue of controlling their economies. Their currencies are tied to the French currency and their reserves were kept in the French central bank in France. So in other words, they're independent on paper only. Now, Gaddafi was going to undermine that by creating an African currency backed by Libyan gold. And he already put aside, I understand, about $6 billion to support this new currency, which of course would have eliminated the need for French franc or the West African franc, which was tied to the French franc, you know? So they saw this as an existential threat to the survival of France's own economic well-being. So he had to be eliminated. That's one part. And then another part that came later was this, uh, this uh, president that was uh, supporting this uh, really aggression to get rid of uh, Gaddafi, uh, Emmanuel, uh, 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 no, I forget his first name now, it's Sarkozy, Nicolas Sarkozy. Gaddafi actually loaned him money to run his own campaign <laughs> in France. Of course, he denied it, but... Very recently, uh, some years ago, he was tried in France and he was convicted on a corruption charge that he actually did take the money. So he had a vested interest in silencing Gaddafi. And they vogue these high moral things, you know. How do you go to prevent somebody from, quote unquote, killing his own people by bombing the country into, uh, into the past century, which is what they've done. And then they abandon the Libya that they put in that condition, right? 
they didn't go to help repair the economy, to, uh, uh, to uh, make sure they put security in place so that the Libyans can actually now enjoy uh, the fruits of the so-called new Libya that they wanted to create. You know, I have conversations with many comrades and they say they really don't care. What? They don't mind that an African country is destroyed, right? They don't mind because they really don't want an African country or African countries to emerge as a rival to the West. So it makes sense to have them in a constant perpetual mess. So long as you can get the essential resources that you need, you can get the coltan, you can get the cobalt, you can get the copper, you get all the oil you need from Nigeria or Angola, you get all the gas you need from uh, Algeria, or now they're building a major uh, uh, plant in uh, Mozambique. It doesn't matter if there's political violence, if there's chaos, if there's destruction in those countries, so long as you get the resources. And in Libya, of course, they were banking on getting the oil. In fact, there's a very interesting story in Newsweek magazine. Before Gaddafi was overthrown, the Treasury Department uh, had a law which prevented American companies from doing business right? You can only do business with an official government in place, right? They waived that law so that these guys that were being supported by the West, even though they were not yet in power, right? They started signing oil deals with Western companies. Think about that. Signing oil deals with a government that is not yet in place. That is in Newsweek, not in some radical publication, but in their own corporate, you know, media. So if you follow all the facts and information, you'll find that there's no truth that they were going to intervene to create a better Libya. The facts just don't bear out. And by the time Hillary Clinton ran for election, what did she say? She said, oh, I had nothing to do with Libya. I just gave Obama advice. He's the one that <laughs> ultimately made the decision to go in. Of course, had Libya not just collapsed and become this failed state, she would have taken credit for it and ran on that ticket during her campaign. But during her campaign, she did not want that photograph to be shown again when she rushed there and took that photograph, posing with the new people that they put in power. This is the hypocrisy that we have to live with, you know? Why was Walter Rodney so critical of the bourgeoisie in the Caribbean? Right. He was critical of the bourgeoisie not only in the Caribbean, but in the Caribbean and in Africa as well. And he said the uh, bourgeoisie as a class, they cannot lead people anywhere except to ruin. And he gave many examples. He said, unlike in Europe, when at some point during its historical evolution, the bourgeoisie actually served a positive role in terms of capitalism. They were innovative. They were creating. They were moving the system forward. And by agitating for better working conditions, for example, and building up their factories, the economies were growing, right? And then they had to listen to uh, the workers and they started uh, bringing uh, laws like press, press uh, freedom, controlling how many hours uh, people can work, uh, controlling um, how old you have to be, uh, abolishing child labor, for example. But he says, as a class in African countries, they don't provide that, nothing positive at all. What they do is they create businesses that charge uh, a lot of rent, just capture the profit. They're not creating anything. So for example, they start a bus company and somebody has five to 10 buses, right? That's a monopoly, but what is he really creating? Nothing. And you have no choice because you need the bus to go to work, right? And they make sure there's no competition. They make sure maybe only five of them own bus companies and buses, right? Because they monopolize the state. You can't just come and start your bus company. You need somebody to give you the approval, right? You need somebody to give you the loan so you can even do it. So in other words, saying the bourgeoisie are serving the roles that the European colonial masters used to, uh, uh, to serve in African countries. They have become the new Europeans and they use the same tactics that the Europeans used, divide and rule. So he looks at his own country of Guyana, for example. 
where historically uh, the British uh, created or and promoted that you know anti-blackness amongst Asians, right, and anti you know Asians you know amongst blacks, so kept them you know fighting constantly. So while they're fighting constantly, they're not realizing that if they came together and made their demands collectively, they could actually gain and improve their standard of living, their working conditions, uh, education for their children, uh, housing, hospitals, and everything. But, it, it, you know, in now, so they have their version almost of the N-word, yeah, in this country. So for, um, for Indians, it was Sami, you know, it was a corruption of a Swami, which is like a honorific, almost spiritual reference to an Indian, you know, priest. But they bastardized it, it became Sami, Sami, a very derogative way. And for the Indians, they call Africans, you know, a Kwashi, you know, which was a corruption of the name, a Khan name, Kwesi, right, which is very popular in West Africa, particularly in Ghana. They turned out to Kwashi. And it was very derogative. It's almost like the connotation of the N word. And that's what they had. Kept them fighting while they enjoyed the benefits of the state. Now, after independence, the Indian elite and the African elite, who now came into power, they inherited the state from the Europeans in Guyana. They use the same tactics up to date. If you go to Guyana today, you still find that nonsense, you know, that fighting and bickering between Indian Guyanese and African Guyanese. And of course, Rodney was creating, was a part of the new party, you know, the Working People's Alliance. That was his party that he was a member of advocating a party that would be open to Indians as well as Africans. He was trying to end that nonsense and saying if we work together as a working class, we will benefit and we will be able to extract concessions from the elite who are now treating us just like the Europeans did. And the same thing in African countries. He was also attacking that, where the African elite, they use what they call so-called tribalism. So they set Kikuyus against Luos, you know, or Igbos against Yorubas and stuff like that. It really sounds like Jamaica was going on. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, you know, and we lost really. And then ultimately, it was not surprising when, when Rodney was, uh, was, was murdered. You know, Rodney was murdered because um, under, you know, Guyana was under, you know, Forrest Burnham, the prime minister, you know, who... Uh, which is so shocking because if you hear his earlier uh, rhetoric, you know, when the country was still fighting for independence, you know, he sounded like a brilliant, progressive, you know, person, but then he gets into power and he's using that same tactic. And Rodney was denouncing that for all the Caribbean countries, you know, as well, and for all the African countries. And Rodney, I strongly recommend a couple of his books, including How Europe Underdeveloped Africa and the Groundings with my brothers. This is a thin book, but it packs so much power. It's remarkable. Please explain how Kwame Nkrumah's prophecy about what would occur to African resources without a proper military to protect them was so accurate. It is so accurate that it's very scary, actually. But it shows you his love for Africa. Uh, it shows you the kind of love for Africa that he had, that Marcus Garvey had for Africa. If you read Garvey's analysis, and of course he learned from Marcus Garvey. As you know, in Ghana, they have Black Star. Black Star became like a national symbol. And of course, that was borrowed from somebody who came before him, who was Marcus Garvey, you know, and the Black Star shipping line, you know? So Marcus Garvey's analysis was apt on, but it's not surprising. If you know there's a continent that has all of the world's essential resources. And if you know they demonized to take over control, and you know they will go to any lengths, Congo, for example, under King Leopold of the Belgians, 10 million Congolese exterminated just to extract resources. So Nkuma knew this history and realized if they can kill 10 million in one country alone, how are they going to stop behaving the same way? 
just because you claim you're now independent. What is to stop them from coming in? Not all independent countries are treated the same. As you know, Israel is a small country. It's an independent country, right? But Israel does not stand alone. When you talk Israel, you're talking United States. So when you think Israel, economy, military, sovereignty, you know it's protected by a superpower. But when you talk about African countries individually, you see how weak they are, right? They have small militaries. They have weak economies. They don't manufacture. There's not a single industrialized country in Africa. That's the sad part. But what is even much, much, much more sadder is that even though they have the most arable, fertile land in the world, Africa imports food. Just think about that. That to me is the profound and most sad element of all. And I don't remember the page number, but Nkrumah writes about that in neocolonialism, the last stage of imperialism. He said, let's not surrender our food independence. If you can't feed yourself, then colonialism exists. He warns about that. Today, Africa spends $35 billion with a B, not S, to import food, and there's still food shortage. When they can use that money to transform Africa's economies, in fact, it would be better if they were importing that food from other African countries. I'm talking importing food from Europe and the United States with $34 billion that's being taken out of the continent, not benefiting a single African country. Nkrumah spoke about that. Nkrumah spoke about having weak militaries. He said balkanized African countries. That's what he called them, balkanized, small, small country. We will not be able to withstand the West. It has been proven 100% correct. Let me go back to the example of Libya. The African Union, which is the successor organization of the Organization of African Unity, which was founded in Ethiopia in 1963 when all the African, there were a few African countries that had just won their independence, not all of them. And they said, this is going to be the organization that brings us together, and now it's the African Union. The African Union wanted to end the Libyan conflict. So the president of South Africa at that time, Jacob Zuma, went to negotiate with Gaddafi. And Gaddafi agreed. So fine. What did he agree on? To hold elections that he would not supervise. He said, the West can come and supervise it. But I want to be a candidate as well. That's my only condition. Yeah. You know, let's cease fire. All sides stop fighting. You say, you know, it won't be a free election. It will be because I'm not going to conduct it. You guys conduct it. Let them come and run it. But I want to be a candidate. They didn't buy on to that because they knew as a candidate, people will remember the things he did for the country. And most likely he would have been elected, you know. You know, he had not been elected after he seized power, right, all these years. But he knew. He was that confident. He was more confident than the West, right? Because they didn't allow that to happen. But here's the part that I wanted to bring up. In order for Jacob Zuma to go and meet with Gaddafi, he had to get permission from the West, from NATO, because that imposed a no-fly zone. So you have an African president. <laughs> Yeah, Nkrumah would be rolling in his grave, really. African president of South Africa, one of the premier African countries, right? Asking the West, please, can I go get permission to fly to Libya without my plane getting shot down? I don't think you need any better example of that African countries are not independent and that Nkrumah's predictions have come 100% to fruition. You mentioned Kwame Nkrumah's book in regards to uh, clearly explaining neo-colonialism. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you believe wretched of the earth carries the same power? Oh, yes, of course. In a different way, though. Wretched of the earth dealt with the cultural uh, demonization, the spiritual 
demonization. Um, it touched on all the, because he was a doctor, see? So he knows human behavior. So that's what he focused on. This is what colonialism has done. So when Malcolm talks about the self-hatred, for example, he goes into a deeper analysis from the perspective only that a doctor uh, can do. And then as a result of all that internalized hatred, self-destruction, what does it also create though? You know, it quite naturally creates the urge for violence to get rid of that oppression. And you know, some people were criticizing him as somebody who was, you know, advocating or promoting violence, but it's nonsense. It's people that are not willing to accept the truth that you cannot impose that kind of barbaric conditions upon fellow human beings and then be surprised that they want, would want to act violently toward that violence to get rid of the violence. So in that sense, it was uh, almost like a, a calling card for people that were fighting uh, to liberate themselves from European imperialism in the 1960s. And then, of course, today, the structures of colonialism are very different now. You know, you don't have physical, you know, white people representing the uh, elements of imperialism. Now you have so-called fellow Africans. So it's kind of uh, different to think about, okay, how can I adopt that same text to now confront, you know, these Africans who are essentially doing the same thing that the Europeans did. And to me, it's not that difficult. We should not overly focus on the, you know, skin color. Let's focus on what they're doing, right? You know, and discount the fact that, you know, they're not fellow Africans, you know? I would not want to call somebody a fellow, like a comrade, when he's essentially doing the same things that the Europeans did to exploit us, to oppress us. They're taking advantage of their black skin tone to do the same thing and benefiting themselves, enriching themselves and the elite that are around him. And the difference between that and Nkrumah's book is that Nkrumah focuses on the practical ways to, uh, to, to not only counter uh, imperialism, but to how to build Africa's economy. It's like a blueprint. So it says, for example, if you want to industrialize, West Africa should focus on producing these types of manufacturers. East Africa should produce this type so that they're not competing with each other. And then West Africa can trade with East Africa. North Africa, same thing, focus on some, you know, manufactured products. South Africa, the same thing, and you trade. And then you have all the regions trading and manufacturing. And then he says, another thing of creating a United States or Africa is that you have automatically a big market you know, you're not going to manufacture a car when you don't have the base to support it, but you have an entire African continent. At the time he wrote that, I don't know what the population of the African continent was, but proportionally it was very large, of course. Today it's 1.3 billion. Can you imagine if you have four or five major car manufacturers in African countries, why would you need to import uh, automobiles from the United States or from Europe? or from, uh, from South Korea, you know, think about that, with a market of that size. And that's one example, a market of that size for every manufacturer that Africa is now importing uh, from the West, from China, from other Asian countries, from all over the world. Africa imports things that could be produced in Africa. And that's why I say that is a blueprint, because it lays it out chapter by chapter by chapter. This is what we should do to build our economies. So they're addressing the same issue, but in a different way. Uh, Wretched of the Earth, uh, the spiritual, the psychological component, you know, to regain your confidence. So you need both, actually, because unless you regain your confidence, you will not be able to implement what Nkrumah is advocating.